to English Buddhist terminology. What you're actually watching here is the very first episode set up by Fo Guangshan's Buddhist College on TV for our English viewers because we know that this channel can now be watched from almost every corner of the world. Therefore, of course, we're not going to leave out our English speakers because you're a very important part of our community. So here, the way we're going to conduct this program is by exploring various Buddhist terminologies in English. So the first thing we're going to look at today is the first step to becoming a Buddhist, which is taking refuge in the Triple Gem. Taking refuge in the Triple Gem is a gateway into Buddhism. A lot of people have asked me, I'm interested in learning Buddhism, and I'm also interested in practicing Buddhism, but how, how do I go about becoming a Buddhist? So here, my answer for you will be to take refuge in the Triple Gem. When you take refuge in the Triple Gem, or when you go to a ceremony that does this, you are actually making a public declaration that you choose Buddhism as your religion for the rest of your life. Now you may think, what if I just believe in Buddhism and I just practice Buddhism, then, then I don't take refuge in the, um, in the Triple Gem if I don't, if, because I don't see the need in participating in the ceremony. Doesn't that still make me a Buddhist? Let me give, an, give you an example. If you were to study at a school as a student, you would need to enroll in that school before you become its, uh, its formal student. So the same goes to taking refuge in the Triple Gem. By taking part in a ceremony like this, it is a step for you to make yourself a true Buddhist. Another example is, when you want to become a citizen of a country, you don't just say it. Say for example, you don't just say, I'm an American, and that makes you one. Because that's not the way that make, that, 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 that's not the way things work. Instead, you have to take oath. You have to show your obligations and commitment to, to our commitments to this country as its citizens. Therefore, the same goes to um, taking refuge in the Triple Gem. If you never actually take refuge in the Triple Gem, you will, al you will always be considered as only an observer who watches from outside the door. So this is how important taking refuge in the Triple Gem can be. What is taking refuge like? Taking refuge in a Triple Gem is like a child seeking for comfort and safety from his parents. When you see a child, uh, a boy crying, if his parents come along, then maybe he sees that it's my mom and dad, then I will, I'm okay now, then he will stop crying. So the Triple Gem does the same in offer, offering us this kind of protection and safety. Also, taking refuge is like a navigator having a compass in his hand when he's navigating at sea, especially at times when he's lost. This compass will offer him the right directions for him to get back, to get back home safely. Also, taking refuge is like you suddenly finding a light in the dark when you're walking in the dark. When this happens, remember, when you have to walk home very late at night on the streets, sometimes even a lamp will give you a much stronger sense of safety. So this is what the Triple Gym does. It offers you a sense of safety and direction in the dark. Now, before I actually go into the deeper meaning of refuge taking, I will start by talking about the three items that constitute the Triple Gym here. What are the Triple Gym? The Triple Gym consists of the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And what is the Triple Gem? In this world, many of us depend on worldly fortunes, say for example money, diamonds or other assets or jewelries to satisfy our e economic needs. But here the Triple Gem offers us a spiritual wealth that satisfies our spiritual needs. So at the same time the Triple Gem offers us a guideline in life. It guides us into the right directions and it also takes us to liberation. The first of the Triple Gem is, the, is Buddha. 
Buddha is a Sanskrit word that means awakened one or the enlightened one. The Buddha has achieved perfection in character and personality, so you will find no, nothing wrong with the way he presents himself or the way he treats other people. He has also attained wisdom that cannot be compared by other people. Thirdly, a Buddha is one whose love and compassion for all sentient beings are impartial and, and non, no different, so he treats us as all the same. The Buddha is also a sage who has transcended the three realms. These three realms, which will be discussed in our later episodes, are realms of form, desire, and formlessness. Or in the correct order, I'll repeat again, the three realms are the realms of desire, form, and formlessness. Here, let me sh tell you a little story about who the Buddha is. Here, when we talk about the Buddha, with a capital B, we are referring to Sakyamuni Buddha. And still, at the same time, if you see a word that starts with a small b, Buddha, with a small b, it means, simply means an enlightened one, a Buddha. So Sakyamuni Buddha, he was a prince born about 2,500 years ago in northern India. His father was King Suddhodana, who ruled the kingdom of the Sakyas in the place which we call today's Nepal. His mother, Queen Maya, after giving birth to him at, Deer, uh, at Lambini Garden, passed away quickly. Therefore, the duty of raising the, the little prince fell onto the shoulders of the prince's auntie, Maha Prajapati. At a young age, Prince Siddhartha married the young and devoted and beautiful Prince Yashodara. So together the two of them lived very luxurious, comfortable and carefree lives inside the palace. However, one day, it was the prince's curiosity over what actually happens outside the palace that brought him outside the wall. And when he had finally left his palace, he was exposed to the shocking truth of birth old age, sickness, and death. This then inspired him to search for um, the truth of life, for the meaning of life, for a reason to why there is so much suffering in life, and for a way to take these people, or take himself, away from the suffering. Therefore he left this palace, his family, and his young son to go into the woods. He followed many different teachers for many years, but none of these teachers could satisfy his questions about life. So after a short while, he left and went his own way. He practiced for six years without not being able to find the right way or the right answer. And it was finally until one evening when he was sitting underneath the Bodhi tree while he was gazing upon the stars that he attained enlightenment. Therefore, he became the Buddha. This is only a basic story about the Buddha, of course. We, if we have a, ever have a chance to actually dis, uh, talk more about the story of Sakyamuni Buddha, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting event. But now, let's get back to the Triple Gem. What makes Buddhism and, um, different from the other religions is that in many other religions, their founders tend to be regarded as a deity or a being with authorities that cannot be challenged. But what makes the Buddha different is that he regarded himself as the same as all the rest of the sentient beings. The only thing is that he is an awakened or enlightened sentient being, while us, the ordinary beings, are beings who are simply waiting to become enlightened. So we are all future Buddhas. This also tells us that we all possess the Buddha nature within ourselves. So when we take refuge in the Buddha, we're actually taking refuge in the Buddha that lies deeply within us. So again, one, we are actually all Buddhas. Therefore, in a refuge ceremony, um, especially conducted by Master Xing Yun, you will hear him saying the following words. Repeat after me, I am the Buddha. Once again, I am the Buddha. So now that you have declared that you are a Buddha, 
you remind yourself that a Buddha will not go around smoking, killing, stealing things, or doing things that will harm other people. So taking refuge in the Buddha is like having a power station in our hearts that generates a lot of light and hope. We'll find no more fear in the dark. And also, it will be like eyes that can see in the dark. It will offer us a sense of security once again. So taking refuge in the Buddha, this power station is a source of energy that will generate peace and freedom of mind within ourselves. So that was the basic meaning of taking refuge in the Buddha. And here, very soon we're going to a short break. And after you come back from the break, we'll talk a little more about what the Dharma and the Sangha and of course, the meaning of taking refuge can be. So don't go away. We'll see you soon. Welcome back. Just before we have just taken refuge in the Buddha. So let, now let us continue down the path of, the, uh, of taking refuge and look at the Dharma. Dharma is a Sanskrit word that has many different meanings. For one thing, it means the teachings of the Buddha that was expounded by him throughout his 49 years of teaching as a Buddha and of course in over 300 gatherings that he held. Another meaning is that the Dharma is writings. They represent the writings in the Buddhist canon, which are sutras and commentaries of the, what the Buddha had said. After the Buddha entered Nirvana, it was his disciples, Mahakasyapa and Ananda, who gathered the Buddha's disciples together and compiled these sutras and commentaries. Uh, later, in, in, later in the history, commentaries were composed and written. Also, the Dharma can be regarded as an embodiment or the spirit of the Buddha. Furthermore, the Dharma is like a mirror that is able to reflect the deepest truth within us. So it shows us how to free ourselves from our worries, our defilements and suffering. Dharma is also the truth that guides us towards enlightenment. So the moment we touch truth, we actually begin to change ourselves. It's as if the moment a light shines into a dark room, the darkness goes away. It's also like a hand that covers up a source of light. Just take this hand away, you see, you see light again. So this is the Dharma. When we take refuge in the Dharma, in a way, we are taking refuge in the truth. So I've talked about Dharma, I've talked about the truth. So what exactly is this truth? You may wonder. Here, let me tell you. The truth was something that was realized by the Buddha. He said upon his enlightenment that all phenomena arise from causes and conditions. And all phenomena are obliterated by causes and conditions. Other forms of truth include impermanence. Impermanence is a truth of life, that everything is in a continuous stage of flux. They c everything continues to change. So what the, mo the moment you're experiencing now will quickly become a path, past, because it has changed. So everything goes, exists along according to this rule, because nothing will exist forever. No phenomena will exist forever. So this is the idea of impermanence. Also, cause and effect was the other teachings taught by the Buddha, that every cause will result in its own effect. So everything you do, everything that happens, will result in an effect. And consequently, this effect will become another cause that creates a different effect, and so on. The next 
example of the truth that I'm going to give you is the three Dharma seals. Of course, we'll ex uh, we will discuss this term later in the future episodes. But basically, for something to be true, it needs to adhere or correspond to the idea presented in the three Dharma seals. What are the three Dharma seals? The fact that, number one, all th everything is impermanent. And number two, nothing has a nature of self. And number three, nirvana is the ultimate peace or tranquility. Another example of the truth is emptiness, that everything is empty in nature. But here I'm not saying everything does not exist. Say, so look, at, look at my hand as an example. You can see that my hand is a combination of bone and flesh and blood. So it in fact, it's not called the hand by itself. So this is what we mean by an, the empty nature of something. The next character of truth is that truth is beyond the limits of time and space. So it's, in, it's internal, eternal. So like the theories I've just presented to you before, impermanence, cause and effect, and emptiness, all of these rules of life or the rules, the way according to which the universe operates will continue to function throughout time. So it doesn't go out it doesn't stop to be true just because the Buddha is no longer alive, because the truth is beyond time. And also it's beyond space. So truth is like water. If you put water in a glass, then it will appear in the form of a glass. But when you change, in, change it into a different container, although it changes in shape, but it never actually really changes in essence. So this is another feature or characteristic of the Dharma. So basically, truth is blended into our surroundings. It's everywhere. It's with us. And it's everything we see. It's everything that we come across. So taking refuge in the Dharma is like building a water works in our heart or in our mind. We know that water cleanses our body and it quenches our thirst. So the same goes to our spiritual, our spiritual needs. Water here can help quench our thirst for the truth, and it can also cleanse our body a mind that has been impure. So water, we know that for the many lives in this world to grow, we need water. So therefore, water is like a source of life. The same goes to this Dharma water. This Dharma water presents, it provides a source of life for our spiritual growth. So who can be the Dharma? You may think, well, what you, who is the Dharma? Who can be the Dharma? Well, the Dharma can be the temples that we go to. It could be the sutras that we read, or it could be our fellow Buddhist. It could be everything around us. So it's anything that points in the way of ultimate truth, then, of course, and anything that points in the way of liberation, then it is Dharma. The next item of the Triple Gem is what we call the Sangha. Sangha is also a Sanskrit word that means a harmonious or happy Buddhist community. The Sangha provides a role model to how we as human beings should behave in this society. So they directly, they create a link between the ordinary beings, which is us, and the saintly. So here the Sangha it consists of people who have come to, the, come to be a part of this community out, there, out, out of their own free will or choice. So nobody actually forced them into it. And within this Sangha, everybody lives according to one teacher and one path. So we all learn from the same idea. We all practice the same way or we all do the same practice. We're not different from anybody. In the Sangha, members are unified in thoughts, so they follow the same rules and precepts. Because in a community, in order to govern or rule a community, everybody needs to abide by the regulations that have been set up. Furthermore, life in the Sangha is based on equal sharing of common goods. Here, harmony has two basic meanings. For one, the monks or the nuns 
living harmony with the prince, uh, the same principle or idea that lead to enlightenment. So here in the Sangha, it was the truth that was taught by the Buddha. So they all practice according to these truths, and they all try to practice and travel towards the same goal. The next meaning of the six harmonies is that their daily behavior follow the six ideals, or what we call the six points of reverent harmony. What are these? They are one, harmony of views, harmony of morality, harmony of benefit, harmony of aims, harmony of speech, and harmony of being. What exactly do these mean? Harmony of views means they have harmony in thoughts, harmony in views and their ideals. Harmony of morality means that they all uphold the same moral principles. So no, everybody's equal in front of these principles. Nobody has any privileges. Nobody lives differently. So they are all the same. And harmony of benefits means that they all live the same way. So no, nobody in this community has more than anyone else. So it's an equal sharing of living goods, basically. How many of aims means, well, they have the same aims. So the, the members of the Sangha try to achieve these aims in harmonious ways. How many of speech means that they try to get along in harmony with the, word, with the things they say. So there will be no arguments. So and they'll always be in harmony in what they say. How many of being means that they all exist or live in harmony. So basically they try not to violate the rights of any other people within this little community. So basically it's all about respect and understanding and respect and tolerance. So these six harmonies equal to how the Dharma should be practiced. There's more that I'm going to talk about uh, the meaning of Sangha, but here let us once again take a short break and see you back soon.